Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe video. It is 1.30 in the afternoon on Thursday here in New York, and I am bringing this message to you uh, with a couple hours to go in market activity. Uh, Chairman Powell of the Federal Reserve has concluded his second day of House Financial Services Committee testimony. And so we're kind of out of the woods of some of the things the Fed uh, chairman is, was going to say and has said. And we look to be uh, set for another week of the market higher. Um, not dramatically so. It hasn't moved a ton, but it is up uh, today. It was up a little yesterday. And uh, so we'll see what happens the rest of the day, Thursday, and obviously on Friday, anything can change. Um, interesting day today because the market, the S&P is barely up at all today, but the Dow is up quite a bit. And that's what happens sometimes when certain companies are really up a lot. They can impact the weightings and the way because of their weightings, they can impact the way different indexes might perform. So anyways, um, I want to talk to you about the Fed today. I want to talk to you about um, the things that matter as we get deeper into July um, and make a couple other caveat type comments on stocks and bonds in general. The, um, the Fed, basically right now, the Fed funds futures rate, the, the futures market is pricing in a 100% chance of the Fed cutting rates one quarter of a point here at the uh, end of July. There is, uh, let's call it a, uh, well, you know, I have the exact number, so why don't I give you the exact number, a 33% chance, according to the futures market, that they would cut two times, that it would actually be a, a half of a percentage point reduction. Um, I'm very, very skeptical that that will happen. I believe that what Chairman Powell signaled this week rather clearly is a one and done quarter point cut. Now, speaking of one and done, the futures market is pricing in a, I want to get this right, so forgive me. I don't usually look at notes, but I just, because uh, of all these numbers, a 59% chance of them cutting again in September. And so as of right now, it's roughly 50-50, a coin flip that they may end up cutting a second time in a few more months, one quarter point cut this month. My own position is that they should not do that second cut, and it as of right now is that they will not do it. But again, I'm going to take my lead on that from the futures market. I don't think that the Fed is going to be surprising the Fed funds market, and the bond market will kind of price what it prices. What does this mean for us? Um, well, there... You know, there is this there is this school of thought out there that they may cut three times or four times by the end of the year. And I think some people might really like that. Um, I'm not one of them, and nor should you be. I find it almost incomprehensible that they would cut that severely unless they had almost this empirical assurance that we were going into recession. Uh, I don't believe we are. I don't believe they, that data exists. But if they were, if we were going into recession and they cut rates four times, it's not going to matter, okay? You will end up seeing risk assets uh, suffer in the aftermath of recessionary condition. But as we sit here now, the cost of capital for American companies is significantly lower than the return on invested capital, than their return set that they see and being able to put, to put liquidity to work, to go invest into their own companies. That's the thing that matters as it pertains to the kind of big picture apparatus right now in the interest rate market and in the overall economy. Um, I don't believe a recession is coming yet for that reason. I certainly believe one will happen eventually. Um, the notion of an insurance cut is not something I believe in or understand, but if they're going to do what they define as an insurance cut, it's a quarter point or half point. It's most certainly not three quarters or, or a full point. So, um, what is exactly happening that would that would warrant this? Well, the fact of the matter is inflation target that they've set, uh, wrongly in my opinion, is at 2%, and we're achieving something around 1.5%, 1.6% real inflation. So that means that they feel that they have um, 40 to 50 basis points of wiggle room to try to push more uh, heat into the economy. Um, 
you have to have a lot of confidence in their ability to exactly pick what the spot would be. Uh, I also believe that they're well aware of the economic contraction that could take place. Credit markets were to freeze up or to you know dramatically slow. Um, so yeah, I do think that they're viewing it as an insurance cut, so to speak. I most certainly do not think it is politically driven or that they are bowing to the pressure from the White House. I most certainly do not think that um, that they actually believe that we're on the verge of a recession. I think that the uh, kind of extra protection argument against it that they would make is more legitimate. I don't happen to agree with the reasoning. I don't think you care what I think, and I know they don't care what I think. So what, what it means for us is that there is a certain backstop in the valuation of risk assets. It means that long-term interest rates are very unlikely to move meaningfully higher because they long-term rates are somewhat set by the short-term rate and, and what they expect into the future. And the long-term bond market does not expect that any Fed anytime soon is going to be allowing rates to move higher. And the in the short term, um, you, you may possibly see equities get a little valuation boost. I think a lot of that's already happened, though. I mean, equities have gotten higher valuation boost in the in the last several weeks and a month and a half in the marketplace. So uh, ultimately, I, I'm dividing up the way we're thinking about these things into two categories, shorter term and longer term. And I'm going to start with the longer term because that's the way I'm programmed to think. It's the way I want my clients to be thinking. And it's much more important. Long term, there is an excess of debt that exists in the global economy. For the United States, it is mostly built up in the sovereign sector, meaning our national government owes $22 trillion, and in our corporate economy that um, they have levered up uh, an additional about $4 trillion, meaning it went from 4 to $8 trillion over the last 10 years in corporate bonds, high-yield bonds, levered loans, middle market lending, bank loans, things like that. Uh, the corporate uh, leverage theoretically, gets put to productive use. So it generates a return on that equity and is economically expansive. Too much debt inevitably lands into bad projects that are wealth um, destroying instead of wealth creating. But the right amount of debt can can juice the, the, the wealth effect to some degree. The government side, you get no such multiplier. Um, you, you have to pay for government spending. You have to run your country. Some of those uh, expenditures people would consider legitimate, some they would not. That's, of course, what all the political debates are constantly about, what the government should, should not be spending money on. But the fact of the matter is you have to take the total amount of debt indebtedness and measure it against the economic capability to pay for it. So long term, I'm focused right now in a very profound way on, on how I see these things playing out and what it will mean to bond markets, what it will mean to yields what it will mean to economic health, what it will mean to productivity. Um, and I think that there's a lot of sensitivity around companies that need to make long-term investments in productivity being hesitant because they're fearful of long-term debt. Uh, I think you throw in short-term uncertainty around the trade deal, and it's understandable why business investment has been starting to tail down. And time will tell if they can get the China deal done. Um, and if it, with the Fed continuing to be a short-term friend to markets, if that will lead to some additional layering of business investment. Um, as I've said over and over again, that has to happen for this economic expansion to continue. If it does not happen, the economic expansion will end, and it may end in a year or two or three, uh, but I do, I do not see a way that you get another three to five years of economic growth uninterrupted by a recession unless there is, in fact, that resurgence or renaissance, if you will, of, of business investment. So that's where we sit now. In the short term, I don't think the Fed can do much to impact those things. They can manipulate the short-term borrowing level, make uh, risk assets feel good, and uh, uh, drive short-term borrowing down, which enhances dollar liquidity, which would be good for emerging markets, which would be uh, good for valuations of risk assets, and um, at some point ends up having to be unwound. So I don't like the uncertainty that exists in the market, but I don't think this uncertainty is new. And I don't think it's different than it was in 2011, 12, 13, 14, when we were 
really moving aggressively into what was going to be a largely monetary treatment of what ailed us post-financial crisis. We had an overly levered society that needed to delever, and we let the households delever, and we and we told the government they don't need to. That was Keynesianism 101. Now we got to figure it out. And if short-term interest rates were to go much higher, the government's uh, debt servicing costs would skyrocket, and it would add to deficits even further. So lest it sound like I'm being very negative on all these things, because all these things are quite negative, to be honest, but they're not new. Okay, And there's no reason to say, oh, my gosh, that means my October markets drop or this or that or the other. The, the uncertainty and unknowability around those things is profound. What I do care about, what I do know, is that there are economic actors I believe in that are not bureaucrats, they're not disinterested third parties, that are operators of brilliant companies, brilliant business models, that have innovation, that have growth, that have creativity, that, that, that their earnings are going to start to come out in the ju- latter portion of July through the early part of August, reflecting what they did in the second quarter, and that those earnings are why we invest that people invest in the stock market have a claim on the future earnings of companies. And for ourselves, we want to claim on dividends that come from those earnings. That's what we do at the Bond City Group. And I uh, believe expectations are baked somewhat low for the second quarter results. And so therefore, you'll see some companies that outperform their low expectations. I think you'll see some companies that don't. And that will be the story of um, the second quarter earnings results that come in the third quarter. I'm more focused on those bottom-up things right now. I know what the Fed is doing. It's been a surprise to me so far this year. I think our portfolios are well-balanced for both the risk and reward opportunities on each side of how this could play out. I do have a section at DividendCafe.com this week applying a lot of this to emerging markets. Ultimately, um, my belief is that it would be crazy to form a short-term investment outlook or a short-term investment strategy around what you happen to believe long-term as far as these various complexities that I'm bringing up today with interest rates, with debt, with government spending and all those things. Um, So reach out with any other questions. I've brought up a lot of uh, more complicated issues here today, and I'm not sure I've strung them all together the way you would want me to do. I apologize. I prefer recording this real early in the morning before my brain is turned to mush, but in the middle of the market afternoon, I, I, if I sound incoherent today, I apologize. Hopefully, incoherence too strong a word. I'm going to let you go. Reach out. Any questions, comments, please read DividendCafe.com for the written version of a whole lot of topics I've addressed here today. Um, succinct information, great charts that may color your information over, uh, you know, appetite more. And thank you, as always, for watching the Dividend Cafe video. Thank you.